Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. It's good to see you all here uh, this morning. If you're, especially if you're new here and you're visiting us, you're welcome. I, I would just say that uh, Trinity Church is a church of very real people who have very real challenges and, and in their life uh, who serve a very real God who's uh, slowly but surely in our lives uh, uh, affecting very real change. So we are just thrilled that you are here. I think it's common life experience. Um, we've all had that experience where we're kind of, if you would, driving along in life and everything is fine. And then all of a sudden, wham, out of nowhere, you find yourself stuck. This is a common uh, uh, story um, of what's happening, but in this particular illustration, uh, Chuck was cruising down the highway. He'd actually uh, been under this uh, uh, overpass before, usually in the left lane for whatever reason, and in this case, he got himself stuck there in the right lane. You can imagine the traffic backup that occurred, both sides, because one side couldn't get anywhere. The other side, of course, had to stop and look. Um, Police, fire, the city sent out engineers, because this not only involved the truck, but it involved the overpass. Matter of fact, quite frankly, they were much more concerned about the overpass than they were Chuck in his truck. And as they all kind of got together, they began to kind of theorize what was the best way. Was it to go backwards? Was it to go forward? Was it to pull them through? Was it to lift up the bridge? What was it? You know, all the different ways. And, and there was great, great debate. And uh, somewhere along the side, I've heard several versions of this story. But my favorite version is uh, waiting in the long line was a, a kid who was anxious and they weren't going anywhere. And so dad took the kid and they were, they, in the crowd of people, they're standing back there watching them all trying to figure this out. Bring, do we bring in a crane? Do we, what do we do? And the kids uh, said, Daddy, I, I don't understand. Why don't they just unstick it? And he said, well, you, you, it's stuck. And they, they don't, if they pull it out, it could damage the, the bridge. If they, they don't want to dig up the road. And the kid said, but, Dad, why don't they just let the air out of the tires? Right? You've heard this one. <laughs> out of the mouth of babes. And lo and behold, that, that six dead 10 inches did the trick. It got it unstuck. Sometimes it's the little things that make a big difference. And that's kind of what we want to talk a little bit about today. We're in this series, Entering the Promised Land. And the whole premise of we're going through the book of Exodus, and Exodus begins with God doing some amazing things for the people of Israel. Um, and, he, and he points them to, he promises them that he's going to take them to the promised land. But in between that great miracle and the promised land is the desert. And uh, God's beginning to try to work some things in them, teach them some things so they can enter the promised land. We talked about how God, along the way, God is he obviously uh, miraculously delivers them from Egypt, but then he miraculously feeds and provides water for them. Last week, we talked about that God gave them a great victory over a superior enemy because they trusted, they, they learned to be dependent, and God was good in their lives. But um, in our scripture today, as we kind of come across the next chapter, chapter 18 of Exodus, the details of everyday life begin to settle in. And, the, and, and at least in this chapter, you just kind of see they're, they're camped out and everyday life begins to take over. And of course, this begins um, with just a visit from Moses' father-in-law. So if you have a Bible, uh, we're going to talk about Jethro. Uh, you might want to turn to uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 18. The relevant verses will come up on your screen. But it's always smart to make sure that I'm telling you what it really says. Start, uh, verse 1 of chapter 18 says this, Now Jethro was the priest of Midian and the father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. 
So we find out a few things about uh, Jethro here. First of all, he's the priest of Midian. In other words, uh, he's, he's not a follower, at least uh, uh, holy, of Yahweh, of the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the Jewish people. Not only is he uh, of a different religion, but he is a priest. He is high up. He makes his living, at least in part, by representing this other religion. We don't know a whole lot about the Midianite religion other than it wasn't monotheistic. It was multiple gods. So he's kind of on, if you would, the other side of the fence, we might say. The other thing is he's Moses' father-in-law. And if you remember the back, uh, back story, uh, when Moses had a run for his life because he uh, committed murder in Egypt, um, he came to the rescue of some young ladies. Their father heard about it, said, bring this man home. And uh, his reward for the guy was to give him one of his daughters in marriage. And Moses took him up on that, and he began to work for Jethro until God called him to Egypt. Well, the third thing we find out here is that uh, uh, Jethro had heard about all that had gone on in Egypt. Um, they didn't have the Internet or newspapers or but I tell you, news traveled just as fast as it does today to a certain degree, especially something as amazing as all the slaves in Egypt are gone. And so uh, what Jethro does is he uh, takes uh, Zipporah, which is uh, Moses' um, wife, and there are two kids, one named because he's a foreigner in the land. After that, another one named uh, God's Help as God begins to show up and say that he's going to help his people. Um, all we know is that at some point, um, Zipporah and the kids were with Moses, and probably before he enters into Egypt proper, or after it was evident that the first time that Pharaoh was going to make this as hard, he sends them back to the father-in-law. Uh, God had told Moses ahead of time, I'm going to meet you at this mountain, and if you remember, Moses was actually watching Jethro's sheep. So it's probably part of their grazing land uh, where Mount Sinai is, the mountain of God. And so they probably prearranged, um, pending God doing what he said he was going to do, we'll meet right back here. And lo and behold, they do. And then uh, when uh, Jethro shows up, it says this in verse 8, Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh, and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they had met along the way, and how the Lord had saved them. Actually, the interesting part of this uh, part of chapter 18, we won't get into all the details, is uh, this priest begins to affirm that God is the God. And as you study this, and again, we won't have the time to unpack this, you see there, there are a few things that Moses does, or that God uses that Moses does to achieve this. The first is, when he sees his father-in-law, Moses, who is the leader of Israel, who is the spokesman for God, he is all that and then some. When his father-in-law comes, this priest of Midian, Moses bows down. He kisses his father-in-law. He, he shows him all graciousness. He submits himself. He shows the proper attitude for a son-in-law. Even though they disagreed, it seems, on some fundamental issues. And then he brings them into his tent, and they begin to, you know, how are you doing? And Moses begins to tell them partly the story that Jethro knows, but, he, but filling in the details and making, you know, separating, if you would, fact from fiction. But Moses tells him two things. First of all, he says, this is what the Lord did with the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It, it's all the amazing miracles. But he doesn't just tell them that. He tells them, he says, also the hardships that befall them on the journey, the people complaining, and the water, and the food, and the, and the fights, and him holding up the hands. I think this is really important, because I think sometimes when we're trying to share our faith, we focus on the middle part. We say, man, if I only focus, if I, if all I have to do is tell them how great God is. And, and a lot of times we're discouraged because we miss the other two. We miss, by the way, the fact that we honor people for who they are, just because whether they're Christ followers or not. 
We treat people with decency. We, we treat people with respect. We, we, we honor their inherent value as somebody created by God. And the other thing, too, is I think there is power of saying, you know what, my life is just like yours. It's challenging. And we do some stupid stuff, and I've done some stupid stuff. And, and, and you know, my finances don't all work out. My kids go crazy sometimes. And, but this is still how God is faithful. We try to paint this picture that, you know, if you have God in your life, everything works out perfectly. It's not in the Bible, and I can guarantee you it's not true in your life. I, I know most, first of all, I know most of your all stories. And second of all, I've heard all this. I mean, I've heard story after story after story. I know a lot of guys who are national speakers who people are really proud of, and, and they should be. They've, God's used them mightily, but I also know the story behind the story. We all have struggles, we all fail, we all grumble, we all, you know, don't walk the walk that we said we were going to walk. And, and Moses shares it all. And Jethro's response is he has a change of heart. First of all, he gives praise to God. Second of all, he declares that Yahweh is the greater than all other gods. And then he follows this up with action and that he, he offers sacrifices whether he, he purchases animals there. I, I don't know how it worked out, but he's, he basically worships God. They have a worship time. And the elders of Israel, it looks like it's accepted as authentic because the elders, the leaders of Israel come and they eat a meal with him and affirm what he did with God. Wonderful. But, but really, I think if you read chapter 18, you'll see that's a setup for what begins in chapter 18. 13. See, Moses lived a hectic life. You got to understand, this is the ultimate startup. This is the ultimate startup. Now, I don't know what you know about startups, but you live in the Silicon Valley, so you've definitely heard about them if you haven't participated in them. But a startup is usually something that you start small. No one's ever done this before, and so they're trying to figure out how to do everything. It's really hectic. You work almost 24-7. It's really tiring. There's a lot of bumps. There's some excitement, too. But imagine starting your startup with a million people. Not only are they a million people, they're not a million people who you have, you know, you got from other sectors that were good at being a nation. These are a million people that have zero experience with leadership, zero experience of having to cooperate. They've always had someone dictate to them what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. I don't, by the way, know exactly if million is right. I'm just saying there's a lot of folks. It is the ultimate startup headache. And we get a kind of a picture of this starting in verse 13. All this has happened with Jethro. He's worshiped the Lord. It says, verse 13, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. See, they, they, they'd slow down. They'd stop for the night, maybe, maybe to rest for a while waiting maybe for Moses' family. And so everyday life takes over. They couldn't handle these issues on the road. Moses was too busy coordinating the move. You can imagine if any of you have moved. I just moved six people in one household. It just about killed me. I can't imagine coordinating a move with this many people. It says, he served as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? And then Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me and I decide between the parties and I inform them of God's decrees and laws. So here we are in this, in this startup. Not only does Moses make all the major decisions that are moving and who does what and how, but when they stop, he is the judge. And you can imagine normal, everyday people have disputes. But you can imagine among people who've just found their freedom, people who just for the first time have possessions of their own, the disputes that might arise. But there's only one man who talks Directly to God. There's only one man who's, who's given the direction, this is how our community should go. And it's Moses. So people line up. And he's got everything from, you know, 
a, a mistake. That, that guy's cow stepped on my chicken. And now we don't have chicken. We don't have eggs. To, to maybe something uh, uh, that's a bigger, bigger deal. So-and-so stole my cow. And everything under, underneath, you know, so-and-so is on my property line, and there's a tree over. I'm obviously modernizing it. You know, all those little things that come up. Not all those things on Judge Judy's court, but all the things that are in the normal courts. And they're all lining up for Moses to decide. And, 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 and Jethro sees this, and he, and he observes, Moses, this is crazy. It's crazy that you could barely squeeze me in. You know, you took one day with me, which I, but it's, it's crazy that you spent all this time organizing and leading the people, and, and you're, you know, you, they look to you when, the, when there was fighting to be done. They look to you when there's resources to be provided, and now they're looking to you to judge, and, and it's so bad that, that you didn't have time for lunch, you didn't have time to take a break, and you still didn't get through the end of the line by the time the evening came. So it's not only crazy for you, it's crazy for them. What a hectic life. And then Moses says, I'm not, I'm not arguing with you, but here's the reality, father-in-law. Here's the reality. God does speak to me. The reality is um, I'm the one who knows the laws. And the, that's the reality. I know it's hectic. I know I have this job. I know I have too many people reporting to me. I, I, I know that uh, you know, I never have enough time for my spouse. I know that, but what can I do? And then Jethro gives him some wise counsel. Wise counsel, starting in verse 17. He says this. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. He says, the work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Now listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But... Select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So there's kind of three parts to what Jethro does here. It starts out with a, um, a you must. He acknowledges, he doesn't argue with Moses. He acknowledges, you know what? From everything I've seen that you told me about yesterday to everything I'm seeing, seeing now, he says, you're right. Verse 19, you must be the people's representative before God. That is your role. Your role is, is when there's not an answer, your role is to take it to God and say, God, how does this one work out? What happens if it's an accident versus they meant to do it? What, what happens if, if, if the person who commits the crime has nothing? You, know, you say if you take a goat, give two goats back, but they don't even have a goat in the first place. What do we do then, God? And he affirms, he affirms that you're supposed to do, do that. And he says, and, and he affirms that he's supposed to teach them the decrees and the laws. He says, yes, that is your role. As God gives you the laws, as God, as God says, this is how we're going to work in the community. And by the way, um, it's important to note that much of the laws, the 626 laws in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, especially that he's about to give in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and so on, they're about being in a community. They're not, they're not all about, hey, this is how you need to worship me. Now, everything's connected to worship, but, it's, but God is, in effect, trying to get them to work together for the first time as a community, as a people of God. And that is his thing. His job is to show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. So there, are, there is a you must, Moses. You must do this. He doesn't fight him on that. He doesn't say, hey, you know what? Somebody else can. No. He can see, he heard the story. He, he sees God's hand upon Moses and he affirms them, him on that. But he says, along with the you must, there's a, if you would, a they can. 
Just because you must do these things doesn't mean that, that there's not other people that can do parts of this. For instance, once you find out what happens when a cow steps on a chicken, you should never have to meet with another cow-chicken situation again. You've decided that. people. You just tell that to somebody else and let them deal with the cow-chicken situation. And so he, he says, listen, there are, there are folks that are qualified. And he understands that there are different levels. And so he says, put some people over groups of 10, some over 50, some over 100, and some over 1,000. He, he understands there, there are different levels. And if some of you are going, man, this kind of sounds a little bit like our judicial system. Uh-huh. You're right. You're right. That's why they often say... American values or Judeo-Christian values, because the West was built on this, not the wild West, Western culture. And he, and, he, and he says, okay, you start small with people that can, like I say, the cow and the chicken thing is an easy one, and so if, if they're over 10 folks, they can, they can do that little kind of thing. And then it gets a little bit more complicated, so you, 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 know, you don't have that many people who can take the next complication, so you just need a few less people to do 50s and hundreds and thousands. And the, and the ones over thousands are probably the elders, the ones in, in each family that are, that are looked upon as being really wise that people naturally go to already. He doesn't take away. He says there are going to be some things left over for you, but they're the most complicated things. In other words, if you have a complaint about your speeding ticket, you shouldn't be going to the Supreme Court with that. Or else those who really need justice that the Supreme Court needs would never get it because they'd be waiting in line behind all the ticket people. And so you have this system. And that, and that in essence, is what, he's, is what he's suggesting to him. Now, he, he does give them some wise counsel, and he says, make sure that you qualify the character. In other words, you, you don't just need people to fill in the spots. We have this discussion all the time um, uh, on the church level. I'm sure in your business, and you have this discussion as well. You have a need. And uh, maybe you need a second grade teacher or you need a, a greeter or, or you need someone to lead a Bible study. And, it, and it's, really, it's really easy to say, well, I'm desperate. I just need somebody in that spot just to throw anyone in that spot. But anyone who's been in leadership and whatnot knows that that's usually a larger headache than it's worth, even though waiting is tough. Make sure you find the right people to do the right things. And, and there are different levels, right? The, the, the person who judges over 10 you know, the, the bar is a little bit lower than the person who judges over a thousands. But he says, you know, basically make sure, A, that they fear God. In other, in other words, they have a relationship with me and they respect, respect and going to obey me, God, that, uh, uh, that they're trustworthy and that they hate dishonest gain. And if you know, the judicial system just falls apart if a judge takes any kind of bribe because then those with resources will always win and justice will lose and ultimately society will lose. So he says there's a you must, he says that they can, and then he says, but remember God has the final word. And this is really important. Jethro gives him good, solid advice, but he understands that God has the final word. When he starts in verse 19, he says, okay, I have some advice to you, but may God be with you. And when he ends in verse 23, he says, if you do this, and God so commands. Remember, he's already heard the goodness of God, and he's already heard that sometimes God chooses to do some things some really unusual ways. So general wisdom would not say, put your back where there's a sea, and the only other place of escape is the army of Egypt. General wisdom would have said, you go a different route. But that's not the way God took them. God specifically took them to the sea to do something amazing. So Jethro's saying, listen, what I'm giving you is great advice here, but you better double check this out with the big guy. Because there's, there's nothing wrong with general wisdom. There's nothing wrong with a, with a church or God's people to look at the business world and say, hey, you know, what can we learn from them? What, what's, what are the latest ideas? What are the, th there's nothing wrong with that. However, sometimes God goes, yeah, that's great wisdom. We're not going to do it that way. Because if we do it that way, you're going to think, you know what? I, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this because, you know, Jim Collins said such and such in his book, Good to Great, and this is what made us so, no. And a lot of times God will say, that is phenomenal wisdom. We're not doing it. 
Because we're not going to rely on man's wisdom. We're going we're to rely on God's wisdom. And by the way, there's nothing wrong here with man's wisdom. Unless God calls you to do it a different way, which he often does, which is why Jethro says, hey, here's a, here's a great idea. There are things you must do. There's other things that they can, but check this out with the big guy. Make sure that God is, is, agrees that this is the way to go so that he may receive the glory. And then, of course, we have Moses' response. What does he do when he gets this advice, starting in verse 24? It says, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. By the way, um, as we go on, these judges will continue to serve as we read in the book of Judges, and we find out there are both men and women that are judging. Verse 26, they served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. So Moses' response was basically threefold. First of all, and most importantly, he listened. He listened. This is really tough in our day and age, especially, I think, for our upcoming generation uh, who have been taught pretty much from the 60s, there's a sh there was a shift where we used to basically respect and follow authority. Starting in the 60s, it was all about question authority. And some of you who are, who, uh, are driven nuts because your kids are questioning you, just remember it was probably your generation that messed it up. And there's something about, here's this father-in-law. It would have been really simple for Moses going, hey, thanks, but what have you done? I mean, thanks. I mean, you, I understand you took care of the daughter and everything, but come on here. Who's the, who's, but he listened. He listened. I think this is really important. Uh, I have a, a great mentor of mine who used to say all the time, none of us is as smart as all of us. None of us is as smart as all of us. And his point was, no matter how smart you are, including himself, uh, that you can never be smarter than the collective. And if you, if you want to move to, to places that you, A, want to get to, that you can't get to, to B, that God wants you there, you need to listen. You need to listen. One of, one of my unofficial mentors is John Maxwell. He's a prolific Christian writer on mostly business things. But he tells a story about uh, going to a, a conference for pastors. And he initially went into it with a terrible attitude. Basically, I don't, I don't see what these guys can teach me. I'm already pretty successful. And in essence, what God taught him, there were some ideas and things that came up, and God kind of humbled him, and he, and he realized um, he'd been cheating himself with a little chip on his, on his shoulder. And uh, he became a better leader. He became actually more respected by others because he really began to live out that everybody has something to contribute if you just listen. How much better would this world, how much better would our government be if both sides of the aisle just said, you know what, I might disagree with them, but they probably have something I can learn from. So he listened. And then next, he organized and you know what, the thing about the Bible is it said he just did this. I can tell you, he didn't just do this. It was a process. It was, it was messy. It was, who do you suggest? And there was arguments, and, and there was compromises, and there was politics. And, and I don't know why it doesn't go into detail, probably because then it would make the book really, really long. But he does. He takes the time to organize this. And in the meantime, he probably still had to do the same job for a while. It's not like just overnight this happened. If nothing else, he had to begin to download all the decrees and laws that God had shared with him so he could download it to others so they could begin to make decisions that were already basically made, just applied to different cases and different people. And then lastly, he focused. In other words, he listened to the idea, he organized, and then he was like, okay, now bring me the bad ones. And he focused. And it saved him time, it saved him energy, but it also saved the people time. 
and frustration. And it was ultimately better for everyone. It was better for him because it freed up his time. It was better for him because he was able to focus. It was better for the people who wanted justice because they got justice quicker. It was also better for the leaders because they began to develop skills and, and, and organize. And, and ultimately, when Moses leaves and when Joshua, the great leaders, leave, the, the Israel is run by its judges. And so it sets them up in a system. It's a win-win-win situation. So I have a question for you. It's a weird question. What's the air in your tires? What's the air in your tires? What's that practical step that might get you unstuck? Or perhaps, what is the practical step that, that might help someone else get unstuck? Because that's the, that's the part of the story that's easy, it's easy to miss, is that... Um, you kind of focused on Moses, who's the ultimate leader, and this absolutely helped out Moses, but other people had to step up and say, hey, you know what, I'll judge. And, and even though, even if you were over just t- uh, over tens and you just took the really, really simple cases, every, every benefit that society took on because you were willing to take the simple cases, you got some credit for You're part of that solution, even though you're not the top dog, if you would. So when I say, what's the air in your tires? It may be something specific. It may be something God has called and and stirred in your heart. And of course, this has practical issues as well. If you're you're a parent or whatnot, it it applies. But it may apply to how you help or support someone else. So I have three questions along with what Moses did. First of all, what what is it that God has called you to do? Or... Who is it or what is it that God has called you to support? So maybe there's a ministry. Maybe maybe there's something specifically that God has called you to do. And it's been on the back burner for a while. Maybe it's to to mentor young folks. Maybe it's to teach a Sunday school class. Maybe it's... uh, um, to start a nonprofit or whatever, but you haven't been able to do to it because life is so hectic. You need to let some air out of the tires. Is that it? And begin to pray for wisdom. What, what is just some general worldly wisdom? It could be really simple. For instance, um, my kids have work to do. They have homework to do. And they waste so much time trying to find stuff in their messy room. And simply, quite frankly, the air in their tires is just to learn to keep their room organized. Based on their personal, organi- you know, personality, some people are. I want everything color coded, right? Some people are. I'm not that way. I like things look organized, but what they are is I, I have a drawer for everything. The drawer is not organized. My, 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 my wife will tell you. Here's my. Here's how I solve the sock problem. You know, matching socks. I just uh, every other year or so I go out and buy white socks, all the same kind. <laughs> every time I pull out two socks, they match. It could also, by the way, be something. Um, we, when I first came here, I felt like uh, Moses. I often feel like Moses, but I specifically felt like Moses in that we hit a period of time where there were some great needs in our church that came up. People who had lost loved ones, people who had lost jobs that needed care. There, there was a lot of pastoral uh, help, and, and I, uh, I went to an individual, and, and he developed a team that we now call our deacons. And our, and our deacons, Paul Hastings, Lisa Prather, Lynn Relia, Bonnie Wilburn, and Jan Ramirez, they, are, um, they handle a lot of, of it. When, when people hit a, hit a crisis here, our deacons step in. Along with the, the yes, amen, along with the, along with the teams that bring food and the, and the people that help. But, but they're, they're, they're the first contact. And it, and it allows, I, I can't tell you how, uh, it not only frees my time up where I can spend more time developing this and more time developing Bible studies and more time shepherding people and things that, that I can do, but, but the elders as well. We constantly are talking about what a blessing the deacons are because um, 
they said, you know what, we want to support God's call on the shepherds of our church, both, both Joel and the rest of the elders. We want to support God's call in their life. There are some unique things that they can do, but there's some unique things that we can do as well. And they, and, and, they, and they found that stirring in their heart, and they responded to that. And so um, now when I have time to bless someone, when I have time to, to go a little extra deeper in the Word, whatever the benefit that comes out of that, they share in that benefit. They don't do it, but it would not be done if they didn't do their part. If they didn't understand what is it that God called them to do and respond. And, you, and here's the thing. You... Unless they've helped you directly, you probably barely even see what they do. It's unseen. I can tell you, I know. The elders know. And more importantly, God knows. And they're not only going to share the blessings of what they do, but they're going to share in the blessings of all that they freed up others to do. In the pro- and I can go on. I can talk about the counters that you never see. I can talk about, I can talk about uh, tech people. I mean, there's just tons of things that go on that are like that. What is it that God has called you to do? And by the way, do you, have you really spent time thinking about that? Other than coming to church and saying, Joel, tell me how to live. Have you really sat down and said, God, what is it you want me to do? Not, not God, would you bless what I do? That's a fundamental different approach than God, what is it that you want me to do? Believe it or not, God has not just called you to live a happy and content life. He's got a purpose and a plan. And by the way, it's a purpose and plan that probably will be more difficult but more fulfilling than the life you're living. Second question, who can help that it's qualified? Who can help that it's qualified? And this is, this is hugely important. As God begins to say that, um, and we talked about this last week, the pride of saying, well, i, I got to do it myself. And scriptures is actually filled with the opposite, right? I mean, most of the time, if you look at Jesus, Jesus never sent anyone to do anything alone. He always sent them in pairs. And even after Jesus, in the book of Acts, you'll see at least two people involved. When Jesus wanted them to go get a donkey, he sent two. When they wanted to deliver a message, there was two that went out. And so who is it? That's qualified. And by the way, qualified is important. Again, this is, a, this is a typical thing. I just want to get it done, so I'll just give it to the first willing person. No. Who's qualified? Now, sometimes someone's not qualified, and you can work alongside them for a while, get them qualified, and hand it off. But who's qualified? See, if God keeps saying, I want you here, I want you here, but you're not there because life is too hectic, then you've got to believe if he wants you there and, and you're here, that he will provide the person or the resources or whatever it is to get there. Or you're out of his timing, or that's not really where he wants you. Because one thing we do know, if God wants something done, it gets done. So who is that, who is that person? Or are you that qualified person? I don't know how many times somebody has come up to me and said, Pastor, what we really need is da 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 Right? And, and in good pastor fashion, I say, yeah, maybe you should do that. <laughs> maybe God say, you, you care about that. You obviously see it. And maybe God's saying, you know what? You need to be that judge over 20, over 10, over whatever. Maybe you need to be the greeter. Maybe you need to organize calling people when they're, when they're not here. Maybe, maybe you, or help find someone. I, I can tell you, um, um, I put a, a lifeline out there very early on. I'm, I'm, I can do administration, but um, it takes me three times as long as a normal person should. So, like, I was a support person, I, actually on a church staff as a support person, and, and um, they gave me the responsibility of typing out the prayer cards. You know how we do here with prayer cards? They gave me that responsibility. And uh, it took me two days. I did it for two weeks, and they took pity on me. But I was able to do it. And there's, so there's a lot of things administratively that I can do it, but it just takes longer. And then every minute I'm do, doing that, it's a minute less that, that I'm in the Word or I'm strategizing. How do we disciple people? Or I need to call someone and encourage them. And, and several uh, years ago, um, 
a member of our church uh, looked at my plea, Jim Panunzio, and uh, he's qualified to take care of details. Amen. He's right. And Jim volunteered to become our director of operations. He is, he is our most faithful employee, and we don't even pay him. Amen is right. And, 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 and again, the reason I tell the story is, uh, um, I, you know, it, I want to encourage Jim, but most importantly, the reason we know that Barnabas sold a piece of land is because the Bible says Barnabas sold a piece of land. And the, the reason that they began to do that and they made Barnabas famous about that wasn't to give Barnabas a big head or to steal his blessing. It's because people needed to hear it and be encouraged. And I want you to be, be encouraged that, that someone... Um, that God used Jim Panunzio to do what he is good at. He, he, he's not a, a, at least a full-fledged pastor. But God has gifted him in terms of, of a heart of compassion and caring for people. But he's phenomenal at details. And every detail that he takes care of that I and the elders don't have to means I get to do something else. And every other thing that I get, Jim gets part of that blessing. It's not my work. It's actually God's work. But he's using me, and I get a benefit from Jim's work. That's how it's... So it may not be... You know, the American thing is just to turn this into your personal health and wealth. I want to get here, and so who can help me? And that, that might be part of it, especially if you're a leader in the church. But it also may be God might say, saying, you know what? I want to do something. You see, I, I want this person to thrive, but they can't because they're setting up the chairs. They can't because they're taking care of the, but you can take care of details. You can count money. You can set up chairs. You can fill in the blank. So maybe you're the qualified one to help let the air out of the tires. And then lastly, and this is really important, where is the Holy Spirit leading? And this is important. We have this discussion all the time as pastors is, you know, how much of, you know, the, the quote-unquote worldly literature should we read? Should we read, if you're not familiar with the business world, but one of the premier writers of how the business world uh, works is Jim Collins. Should we read Jim Collins? Should we think about what it means to take the church from good to great? And is, is it secular? Is it sacred? Is it? And I, and I always go back right here and I say, you know what? I think we, should, we, we would be foolish not to listen. But then we also would be foolish not to go to God and say, hey, God, what do you think about this? And sometimes God says, hey, that's great advice if you're trying to make money, but eh, I ain't, and I don't want you to. Sometimes God, it's a Jeffro thing, God says yes, because then that will free up your time to do what's important. And sometimes God says, great idea, but not my will. If you ask those who know me well, those folks that I complain to, you ask them, what is it that Joel covets that he desires more than anything? He thinks that his ministry will just take off. Um, I would be surprised if you didn't hear unanimously, Joel's always wanted an executive pastor. Somebody to take even more of the administrative duties off my plate. And I've been seeking and asking God for that just about since the day I got here, maybe even before I got here. But kind of like Paul, the answer I've basically gotten from God is, you know what, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. And God has taken us to sweep. We, he's, that's why we call ourselves a little church that could. Because we get, um, God gets an amazing amount of things done with a very little amount of people. And he gets the credit. I love the result. I don't like the process. I'd still like an executive pastor. But my point is this. You have to ask the question, where is God leading? Just because it's a good idea does not mean it's something that you should do. You need to trust him. You need to trust him. So what's the air in your tires? What has God called you to do? Who can help that is qualified? And where is the Holy Spirit leading you? Remember, the end result here isn't just, I want to live a thrive. This isn't, you know, three steps to success. The idea is to enter the promised land. We want to enter the, we want to enter for us that abundant life that Jesus talks about. He says, I don't, I, I just, I don't want them just to live. I just don't want them to survive. They're going to have trouble in this world, but I want them to live life that is full, that is abundant. That's what this is about. 
It's not just about getting the truck unstuck. It's not just about getting your life unstuck so you can go all along your merry way to prosperity. Fundamentally, it's about accomplishing the work of God in your and my life. Let me pray for us. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for your love and your goodness. I pray, Lord, um, we need your wisdom. Would you reveal the air in our tires, what that thing is, if there's a thing? And God, would you humbly help us to accept whether um, there's something you want us to release or, or there's something you want us to help other people release? And then give us the courage to follow where you leave. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.